Is my voice co- There we go. Hello. How's everybody doing today? Last talk of the day. Um, I, I end up telling people, like when I talk to people about doing presentations and stuff, I end up giving them good advice, and then I never follow it myself. And one of the best things you can do is use a light background with dark text. So I'm going to warn you that everything I have is a dark background with light text instead. So this screen will constantly be washed out. It was on purpose, just so I could break my own rules. So here we go. Let's get this thing started. So this is Level Up Your Security Mindset. My name is Nathan Hamill. I am the head of cybersecurity research for Kadelsky Security. Um, some of my colleagues are here. You may have seen JP talk earlier today. Um, I do quite a bit of public speaking on various security topics. Most of them are more on the offensive side, so this is a little new for me to talk about something that uh, I kind of have conversations with other security people about that are problems, yet we don't seem to be addressing too well. Uh, I'm also on the Black Hat Review Board, uh, so for this conference and for Black Hat USA, if you've ever submitted a talk, it's possible that I looked at it. If it got accepted, it was because of me. If it got rejected, it was because of somebody else, so just keep that in mind. So enough about me. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for coming to this talk. Um, and I know it's strange to kind of thank everybody before the talk even starts, because you might walk out of here saying that was terrible, um, and some people might... Uh, but it's hard, it's, it can be a hard sell to come to a security conference and listen to somebody talk more about mindset and less about, you know, attacks or, you know, new, new technologies. So thank you very much. And on that thread of optimism, um, you know, there won't be any demos, no O-days, no fireworks, explosions, or fires. Um, and I promise that's the last time I use those transitions. It's just I'm using Keynote and I never get to use those. So in, in our lines of work, these are the things that we focus on a lot because these are the fun parts of security. Focusing on O-Days and new tools and new techniques and stories that people come up with that they did a hundred million different ways and they were able to gain access to some piece of sensitive data. But when we go back to work Monday morning, the thing that really eats us alive are things that are simple uh, from an attack perspective, but complex from a protection perspective. So things like password reuse and password resets and things like that. So we have no shortage of problems in our industry. So I decided to take a few of these things and carve them up into a couple of different sections. So for each of these, I'm going to try to sprinkle in some things that I think are recommendations for that. Um, some of them I'll summarize at the end. Uh, a couple of the spots will get a little bit ranty. I'll try not to do that. I have a tendency, tendency to go off on a tangent, so there's a nice lady up front who's going to hold cards up and let me know that I need to speed it up. I also stay highly caffeinated when I travel, so um, if I start to really speed up, you'll know I need to use the restroom. So where are we at today? So we have this view of security that is kind of like a buffet. So we go down the line and we look at all these different things and we say, hey, firewall, and hey, antivirus, and ooh, EDR, I'll take one of those. And we take all of these different solutions because it's seen that we have to have those. So if, if something bad happens and we get owned, we can say, at least I took the orange chicken. So every single one of these things we end up evaluating with different criteria based not necessarily on the effectiveness of it, but just having it in general, and that causes us a lot of problems. Um, I don't think I need to tell the people in this room that security is often an afterthought in the products that we buy and the things that we put inside of our organizations. We get left out of a lot of conversations, important conversations, because at many organizations, people see security as a roadblock or, or difficult to deal with. Um, if you've worked in the field for quite a period of time, you'll know that even some of your peers are difficult to deal with. So if we have difficulty dealing with each other, then it's not a far stretch to think that the people we work with would also think that we're difficult. Um, we tend to focus on unrealistic threats, unrealistic risks, things that may or may not happen, impossible scenarios, because we feel that's our job. 
And the other thing is, is we're kind of rigid and inflexible. When people bring us things that they want to do, we tell them we should, they shouldn't do that because the entire company could go out of business. So where do we need to be? We need to have security engineered into the solutions that we purchase or the things that we build. If we are part of a product company, we want to make sure that we're engineering security in. On top of that, we need to make sure that we have security by default because Additional security steps that people have to take that they don't know about or are complex to configure, they won't do it. So quite often, the initial state is kind of how it stays. We need to be collaborating with other business units. We need to be more focused on real risks and real threats. And we need to be agile and flexible, something we don't typically do. And one of the big things we need to do or think about is the fact that all of these problems, security by default, you know, engineering security into products aren't technical challenges. They're social and political challenges. So we have the technology to solve these problems. It's the adoption, the engineering, the ease of use. All of those things are what causes us problems, and that's what this talk is about. Because there's really too much at stake. And I think when we think of technology being dangerous to us, we think of Skynet and robots that want to wipe out humanity. But we don't need a Skynet level event for the technology we use on a daily basis to be dangerous to us. We already have surgical robots and medical implants and autonomous cars and drones. And these things are only going to increase in size. And we need to be part of the conversation making that better, whether it's in our organization or whether it's external to us. And there's no shortage of things actually working against us. So some of this talk is about us not doing the right things or how we can change as security professionals. But we also have things that are working against us as well, and I will try to cover that. Because our jobs will only get harder. The size and scope of what we do will get more difficult, and the size and scope of the data we collect and have to protect will get, will get uh, much more large. So let's kick off the first section of perspective. And probably what you're thinking is, can't I just hack the planet better? If only it were that easy, then we would all be doing it. So as security professionals, quite often we run into some challenges where we kind of fight against ourselves. So when we do a report or the output of our assessments and the various activities that we take, Quite often, our recommendations are unrealistic because we haven't considered all of the implementation problems, all of the things that developers or the product teams have to deal with. Uh, our findings are complicated. Uh, we don't think about end users and how they consume our output. And in general, we're difficult to deal with. That's also a theme, too, by the way. You'll see me mention that. And when people don't understand us, right, we like to say they're idiots, or they're just too lazy to put in the work, which, just, which isn't the case. So we have a lack of empathy in the people we deal with as well. Like, we don't really understand their situation. We're just, why can't they understand? We're only trying to protect them from being owned. And it can be fun to think about a world run by security professionals uh, until you start digging into the implementation of that. So if you think about it, um, everybody would run Linux, of course, with some kernel that they compiled themselves with only specific flags. Um, all software would be open source and, of course, audited by yourself because you have nothing but time to just sit down and audit all of this. And why would we need GUIs? Because everything is just a command line tool waiting to be used. And what we don't really think about is that security in most organizations, unless you're a security company, uh, isn't a profit center, it's a cost center. So that means we need other business units to make money for the company so that we can continue to do our jobs. If you've seen any of uh, Alex Stamos' talks over the past couple of years, he talks about security nihilism. So this fact that if, if your system isn't super secure against some unrealistic attack, then it shouldn't exist. Um, you know, why put any solution in place? The users are just going to make the wrong decision anyway. Or why even do our jobs? Because if the NSA wants access to the data, 
it's they're going to have access to the data. But the fact of the matter is, is making things more difficult for attackers has value. If it costs somebody money to send spam, then there, it becomes an ROI problem. If we, if we force attackers to burn an O-day to gain access to some data, there's value in that. And I think that this balancing of risk is something that we need to take into account. Another thing that we need to do is think about our mission. What are we trying to accomplish in our security teams and in our security community? You know, our mission needs to align with the people we serve. So we need to align our mission with the business units, we need to align our mission with the larger community, and we need to align our mission with ourselves, which can be quite difficult. And let's talk about offense, because that's where we like to spend a lot of our time. We're here at a security conference where a lot of offensive things are being talked about. Um, and this is the cool part of security, right? We love a good story. Somebody says, hey, I compromised these 10 systems. I pivoted a bunch of different times, and I gained access to some sensitive data. We put a lot of emphasis on O days and difficult scenarios and all of these different things. But they don't necessarily, and that stuff's important, right? But they don't necessarily help us on a daily basis. So a thing to take away is protecting an organization isn't a matter of having better offensive capabilities. An entire stack of vulnerabilities and bugs doesn't necessarily make you more secure. Success in a security program isn't measured that way. And I think we like the offensive side of security because it's much more of a technical problem. And it's very easy to measure, right? How many bugs did you find? How much time did you spend? You know, what severity were they? Very easy. On the defensive side, I think we don't often think about the defenders of the systems we're testing. So we like to applaud ourselves and pat ourselves on the back whenever we compromise something or look, look, how, look how stupid this system was configured. Uh, these guys can't secure anything. But the fact of the matter is, is the people that we're testing against, so when we play the offensive side of security and somebody else is playing the defender, the defender is rarely set up for success because they are measured quite differently. It's not as clean as the technical side. So how do you measure defense, right? Um, did nothing happen? Um, did you stay within budget? What is your budget? How much money did you spend this quarter? It's a completely different set of problems. So, you know, Offense is a technical problem, and defense is a social and political problem. And this is a theme that probably runs through many different keynote presentations at security conferences that we just haven't been able to digest. And speaking of these keynotes at these conferences, throughout the past couple of years, you'll see people stand up and they'll say, who are the defenders in the room? And people raise their hands, and everybody claps their hands, and everybody walks out of the room when they're done saying, I'm glad I don't have that job mainly because of the social and political issues that they deal with as defenders. So understanding the defender's viewpoint, we have to understand that our solutions can't be perfect. We have to be okay with imperfect solutions because better is still better. We may not be able to have best, but there's value in better. And I know what you're thinking, so... I know what he's getting at. He's getting at risk reduction. Yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. And if we think about real risk, our job as security people is to understand risk. But we don't always take in all the factors. Um, I believe in my um, abstract for this talk, I said that we focus on a lot of worst case scenarios. And I think we don't do it to be malicious. We just feel it's our job to handle the worst case scenarios. And I like to measure this in what I call the burner phone at DEF CON. So before I go into this, does anybody bring a burner phone to DEF CON? Oh, okay. How many people are lying about it? Put your hands up. Okay. Just checking. So the burner phone at DEF CON is something I see a lot of people doing. 
And I tried to get them to quantify the risk of, of doing that, like what they're trying to accomplish, because they've basically taken their fully patched and fully updated iOS device and grabbed a very inexpensive Android device that's running about three versions behind and has probably never seen a patch. So to me, that's not a good risk trade-off. Um, I would just lower my profile and hope for the best, because not everybody in the world is out to attack you personally. Um, I, I kind of use that as my way of determining risk, and when I try to explain it to people, some people still tell me I'm an idiot and my credentials and everything are probably still out there. And they could be right. But our relationship with risk needs to change. We can't go on this tangent of risk elimination all the time, because taking risks is necessary to be successful. And if you talk to developers and product teams, they take risks every day. And many of them are very successful. So I think that we need to take more risks and add more innovation thinking to our security programs. And if we do it right, if we have the balance of what we need to do, then the people we serve will see us as being more flexible. And that also means change, which is another thing that scares security people. And once again, I don't think this comes from a bad place, right? This really comes from the fact that change introduces risk, and we feel that it's our job to eliminate risk. For a better part of my career, I was a consultant. So I really liked the perspective of being a consultant. I got to see how many different organizations did things, many different verticals, financial, manufacturing, and it really gave me a good overview of what to do and an even better view of what not to do. Um, and one of the parts of doing this that I heard, one of the biggest excuses I've heard is that won't work here. So I understand that's good. Some companies do that, but that won't work here. And I think that won't work here is an excuse we use too much. Because how do we know it won't work here? I mean, perspectives change, people change, management changes, people get other jobs and move on. It's our job to convince people when there's something valuable. If it's a really valuable thing we should be doing, and I realize I'm talking in abstract terms here, then it's our job to convince the people that need to change to change. So we really need a perspective shift to handle some of these issues. And there's, this, this section was a little ranty, so there's not a lot of takeaways other than don't do that, which is a, one of my other rules that I always say, you know, never should just say don't do that because that's not a valid solution for anything, but don't do that. Um, so we should be more of a, of a change agent, focus on risk reduction instead of elimination, and increase empathy and understanding, which is another topic of this talk. So let's talk about the fun part of security, the social aspect. The future of security is a social and political challenge, not a technical challenge, which means we have to increase our communication, increase our ability to empathize with the people we're trying to change, and be a part of the larger conversation. You know, our, our mission needs to involve other people. And once again, I know what you're thinking. We have to talk to people, and that is true. Uh, we can't continue to tell people that their problems aren't as important as ours. Or um, if they did this one thing, then the entire company would collapse. Um, overall, we just can't be difficult. And soft skills aren't optional anymore, if they ever were. Because we all know, even if you're a genius, if everybody hates your guts, Nobody's going to want to work with you. You could be the best X person in the world, but if you're difficult, people would rather work with people that they get along with and that they like. The, the big topic here is that you can't be successful by yourself, regardless of your job position. And that means we need to think about this word. No is the default reaction that we get many times when we're asked something. And no can be intoxicating, right? It feels good to say at first. And it feels good to say from our perspective because we feel that we're saying no from a place of good intent. So that kind of gives us an excuse to say it. 
But no is easy. It's yes that's hard. It's yes that's a challenge, right? So to many people that I talk to, that's why they got into security in the first place, is because of the challenge. It's a challenging job. It's a very rewarding job. Uh, so yes is what we should be telling people. And we've kind of become a roadblock at many organizations. And that's kind of sad because we all know what happens when people don't like doing something. They don't do it. We're also slowing down the pace of business when we say no or when we become a roadblock. And we don't set other people up for success. We kind of have this us versus them mentality, which is funny because we all work at the same company. We're not in competition with each other. We're in competition to be successful. And I think we often feel, too, that we are the smartest people in the room. Like, people can't possibly understand what we go through. We do this and this. Um, and when in actuality, it's the other way around. And we do make some excuses for this. And uh, here are some terms uh, that you probably heard. Uh, PEBCAC. Does everybody know what PEBCAC means? Problem exists between keyboard and chair. Uh, there's no patch for human stupidity. That's another one that I've heard throughout the years. Um, you know, there's no cloud, some, just someone else's computer. This one still amazes me in 2018 that I run into security people who are anti-cloud. But they're not anti-cloud because of some technical constraint or some privacy consideration. Most of the time, they do have this attitude that it's somebody else's computer. And I'm like, yes, somebody else's computer where they, some other company that has a vested interest in your success and has a team of people doing all the stuff that you don't want to do. Great, if you've, ever ran your, uh, if you've ever ran your own WordPress implementation or your own mail server, you'll know what I'm talking about. However, if you, if you ever do want to get into a situation where you want to store your files on some uh, random stranger's computer, well, there's a blockchain for that. So Filecoin will allow you to store your files on some random stranger's computer. Cool. I like this picture because I've ran into this situation before. Um, I've always tried to be helpful, even when it wasn't my job to be helpful. <laughs> and uh, I ran into somebody before that couldn't figure out why their computer wasn't turning on. And this was the problem. And although it's funny to look back on, and it's funny to uh, think about, it becomes very scary when you realize that that person is on the front lines of protecting your organization. And then it becomes scary because you can't be everywhere at once. If your security program requires you to be everywhere at once, then I can guarantee you that it will fail. And by you, I don't mean you personally, I mean you as in your security team. We need the users around us, we need the teams around us, we need the groups around us to be an extension of our security team. And I'm not just talking about security champions, right? Because security champions are people we specifically arm with knowledge that help us perform a security function. Uh, I'm talking about the regular people that work at our organizations. You know, are they going to resist some, you know, nation state level attack? Of course not. But the more people we have armed with basic security knowledge, the better. Uh, because the big secret is, is people find interesting ways to not do things they don't want to do. And if I were any good at Google image search, I would have found this image. But many of you have probably seen the image of this gate at an apartment complex and there's no fence around it. And there's footprints in the snow just walking around the gate. Because people were too lazy to open the gate. And why would you open the gate? There's no fence. I think where our problems stem from, a lot of our problems stem from, is from our goals. So our goals are not aligned with the business units many times. So if, if the development team's goal is to move fast and our goal is to move slow, then you can see how we will never be on the same page. And I realize that that was a little contrived, but if the... If the development team's goal is to push code into production every four hours, and the security team says that every single piece of code that goes into production needs a manual code review, you can see how we would never be on the same page there. Aligning goals is the first step to attaining them. Because if there's ever 
If, if you've ever worked in an organization where they had waivers for things, then you will know how often that waiver system gets used. So uh, one of my customers actually had a waiver system, so they could push code into production that had high severity vulnerabilities. Um, and every single time a high severity vulnerability was find, found, the team would just file, uh, file a waiver, and of course the code would go into production anyway, and they would say, yeah, we'll put it in one of our sprints. I bet you it's still out there. Information sharing is another area that we struggle with a little bit. And I think it's the no patch for human stupidity problem. We feel quite often that people will take the information that we share and use it against us. So we're naturally kind of paranoid about this stuff. So we don't always share information, even with, uh, even with the people internal to our organizations. So product teams, development teams, we kind of guard information because we feel that's our job. And I think we should find interesting ways to share ideas and information. And, in forums like this, security conferences, local security meetups, those are great opportunities to talk to your peers. Because even if one of your peers works at a competing organization, we all have the same goals, right? We're all trying to secure our organizations as best we can. Uh, silos are another, this is kind of a pet peeve of mine because um, multiple times in my career, I've been confronted with a manager who is fresh off of reading the newest management book. And they would try to implement the things in the book without thinking about the intent, right? The intent may be different than what they're trying to do. So silos between communication and information sharing are bad. I think we can all agree. But silos create expertise. So imagine this. Imagine you need, an open heart, you need to have open heart surgery. You need a transplant. So you go to the hospital, and to your horror, you see the proctologist scrubbing in to do your heart transplant. Um, and they're doing that because they're trying to break down silos um, and get more exposure to the proctologist with hearts. It's probably not something you want to do. And this image is perfect um, because that silo is falling in the wrong direction. So I didn't know that until I read the description on the stock photo site that I was using. So, cool. We need to focus more on enablement for our activities and, and what we do, what we're trying to do, aligning goals. We need to ask ourselves, what have, ha, what have we done to enable the people and groups around us? What steps have we taken? I'm willing to bet that not many security teams have a quality measurement for enablement. Maybe it's getting a little bit more now, but we don't necessarily measure our success in enablement. But maybe we should. And we can't say that our goal is to, we've enabled them basically by not letting them get pwned because that's really not a valid excuse. And we can't also, what, one of the things with enablement that I should probably talk about is we don't want to be the reason why an initiative fails. So if, you're trying, if your company's trying to do something new, they're trying to launch a new product, a new service, if they have an excuse to point back at the security team for the reason that initiative fails, that's a huge problem. So if we focus on enablement and the initiative fails, then they can't point back to us and say, well, you know, it was their fault. And if we look at disciplines that are more human-focused, like case management, you come up with these phrases like this, and, and it may be a bit utopian to think about security empowering people, although I guess it could if you're, you know, if you're setting a higher level of security standards, then we've basically uh, became an empowerment uh, arm, but for the most part, engage, enable, and enhance. So how, how are we engaging the people we serve? How are we enabling them in their mission, and how in the end, have we enhanced the security posture of our organization? And one of the ways I think we can begin that conversation is through brainstorming. Brainstorming sessions are great because they don't cost you anything. You get free ideas for the span of an hour or two or however long your brainstorming session lasts. 
How many, how many people here in a security role do regular brainstorming sessions? Few. One thing that you can do is bring people into the conversation. So if you do these brainstorming sessions and you bring in somebody from the product team or the dev team, it's a great way to increase communication flow between the two, between the two groups. Um, you know, removing constraints and just saying, let's throw out some ideas. And sometimes they get a little ridiculous, but sometimes in the most ridiculous ideas, there's a hint of something that actually might work. Another thing that you can do in this area is prototypes. If you're trying to communicate something to one of the teams, if you're trying to say, hey, I want to build this new dashboard and here's all this information and, and you're like, yeah, that sounds good, that sounds good. If you show them a prototype of it, you have a lot better chance of influencing a decision in one way or the other. And I honestly don't know how anybody does their job these days without knowing how to at least program a little bit. But this isn't necessarily even programming a solution. This could be a spreadsheet or a Word document. All right, scale. So scale causes us quite a bit of problems. And if I'm going to be optimistic about it, it's going to cause us a whole lot more problems over the next few years. So you have that to look forward to. Everything is smart. And if we measure, if a consumer measures, right, the definition of the smartness of something, it's usually measured on its connectivity. So in the ancient days, in the ancient times, you used to wear a fitness tracker for a week, a whole week, before you'd plug it into your computer and upload your results. Nowadays, your watch may have a cellular connection, and it may, in real time, upload your results. So we measure this definition in our connections. And what this really does is it creates a complex attack surface that's really hard to wrap our minds around. Let's think about something that everybody, that we always tell people they need to do, like patching. This becomes infinitely complex when you think of patching and product lifecycle. So for something like your phone, your watch, a tablet, it's easy to see how over the next couple years, you're going to replace that device anyway, because that's just what people do. But what happens when that phone becomes a refrigerator or a car. These aren't normally things that we replace every couple of years. That's going to be a problem uh, because it's not realistic to think that that product manufacturer is going to support that device for inf infinitely as long as the car lasts. Some cars are 20, 30 years old. And we could just say, well, you know, just disconnect the car or disconnect the refrigerator. But it might not work. You know, if that refrigerator doesn't have an internet connection, it may not regulate the coolness and may just, ne next thing you know, you have warm drinks. So we need to think about this because it's not a matter of if, it's when. Because these devices are out there now. And if you think, hey, that smart a smart refrigerator is never going to make it into my workplace, I would urge you to not think that way because many people said that about the iPhone. Hey, that's cool and all, but I just can't see ever needing anything other than my BlackBerry. And look where we're at today. There's this modern reality, too, that even the things that we purchase kind of work against us. The services we use work against us. And Bruce Schneier had this quote that I liked. It's like, everyone wants you to have security except from them. So Google wants you to have security, except they want to be able to read all your email and serve you ads. Facebook wants you to have security, except they want to understand you so intimately that they can target ads. The government wants you to have security until they think you've con committed a crime, and then they want to have access to everything. We can take this to supply chain issues, which have been a real problem, because the computers we use on a daily basis, we trust an amazing amount of things. That system was built in one place, the components were manufactured in another, and every single piece of software we basically trust. And on that front, machine learning, why not? Let's, talk, let's throw a buzzword in here. When we approach problems from a security perspective, quite often what we're doing is we're thinking of confidentiality. When we think of a breach, we think of losing sensitive data. And I think in the future, 
that is going to be less of a problem than integrity. So from your favorite certification exam, the CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Confidentiality is usually what we're worried about. Availability is a business problem. And integrity, who cares? But we've run into so many systems these days that are autonomous, that consume information without human input, and makes decisions on our behalf. So in the future, integrity is going to become much more important. And even availability won't necessarily be a business problem. What happens when a surgical robot loses connectivity in the middle of a surgery? I'm asking, I don't know. I haven't looked it up. But those are the questions that we need to ask. That's an availability problem. We can't solve problems of scale alone. That is just a fact. So we aren't going to solve these problems individually. Um, especially, think about patching. Think about smart refrigerators. How do you, as a security professional, solve that problem? And one of the ways that we can try to affect that change, or secure by default, or any of these other things we're trying to affect, one of the ways we can do that is by banding together and forcing the vendor to provide us a solution. We shouldn't allow vendors to just sell us stuff when they haven't thought about the impacts of their technology on our day-to-day -day business. Mm. Fixing problems of scale, we need to think beyond patching. We need to push for security controls and baselines, arm people with the right tools. So if we give people tools to solve a security problem, it better work properly, because um, you won't get another chance. We need to look for options for self-service, so maybe that's whatever you can self-service, and that gets more uh, time off of your security team, and leverage automation. Velocity. Velocity is a favorite topic of mine lately, because everything is fast. So in the good old days, uh, development had stages. <laughs> and at each stage, we could plug in a security process. And I think that that made us feel good. And then development teams were like, oh, we don't do things that way anymore. We just kind of wing it. OK, it's, they don't wing it. They have agile methods. They, the methods have changed. The viewpoints have changed. Some, some organizations probably still do have a release engineer whose developers can't push code into production. Uh, that's somebody else's job. Uh, but those days are gone for the most part. And customers are used to fast. So it's not, if we ask our businesses, hey, we should probably slow down, um, that's not going to be a good day for us. And on this front, um, and I, I really hate the term DevSecOps. Not because I think the concepts are bad, it's just that some vendors have latched on to this term, and it's used in every single piece of communication, every single slide deck, every single everything. So, uh, but that is one way to solve the security problem. Because we have an obligation to make whatever solution we're putting in place usable, accessible, and simple. And probably many of you have run into somebody who never put a password on their phone. Never put a passphrase because it was too inconvenient. And then the use of biometrics became more of a thing, and then all of a sudden now they're at least locking their phone. So is that the most perfect solution? No. But is it better than not having anything? Yes. Once again, going back to solutions that are imperfect but better than where we were. We also need to think about how we incentivize the people in our organizations because we like to say complexity is the enemy of security, but every single day the people in our organizations are ranked on adding complexity and features. So that type of scenario really does work against us. And Halvar had this quote that I really liked. It says, nobody ever gets promoted for saying I deleted 800 lines of code. And this is a tough problem. Um, and there aren't a lot of really good solutions. So I would say, you know, let everybody have a code removal sprint, but I'm sure everybody in the room would laugh me off the stage. Um, so that is a tough problem. And, and I think the, the, where that starts is having a conversation with the management of the organization and stressing the fact that there is code today that you push to your customers that is not used by them that is opening your attack surface. But what we can do is leverage velocity. So we can take the thing that's working against us and use it to our benefit. 
So as velocity increases, so does responsibility. So if you're a developer and you're pushing code into production every couple of hours, you probably won't last very long if you keep breaking things every time you push something into production. So the best way we can do this is to try and convince the development teams that code quality and security increase reliability. The uh, Utilizing security champions is another way to do this. And I like activities like threat modeling because when you teach somebody how to threat model, they don't ever really turn that off. So the more people you teach to threat model, you, you, you come to find out, yeah, that's just kind of how they always think now. Like, you can't, you can't turn it off. So that's one of the reasons I like threat modeling. And you don't really get multiple shots at this. So if you're going to put something in place, you probably should make sure it's going to work in that situation first. And don't make people do your thing. So uh, if we purchase a solution, if we go down that road, um, we probably shouldn't crank it up to 11. I see, 10 minutes. Because that increases friction. And friction is what we're trying to remove. Um, this is probably not going to be a popular viewpoint, but uh, bug bounties will not save you. I know everybody loves a good bug bounty. Um, but securing your organization isn't a matter of having more bugs. So if you are a very mature organization, you have a lot of steps down, then you might find um, that bug bounties provide you uh, a valuable service. And we should, we should reward people for finding bugs in our products. What I am opposed to is replacing another structured process with a bug bounty, because they're not meant to solve the same problems. And moving along, here's another thing to think about in this last section. Our problems are not local anymore. Our pro we have global problems. Somebody in one part of the world can release an, an app and have it be consumed in another part of the world in the same day, uh, quite often in a matter of minutes. So we need to keep this in mind as we think about our strategy. The skills gap that everybody reads about is a problem. So different sources kind of have different sets of numbers, but they're in the millions. Millions of people, we have a gap in our, in our community. And now, although that sounds good for us, for our longevity, um, it's not necessarily good for us from a planetary perspective when we require safety. So I would like to think about different ways to solve the skills gap. And if you thought I was going to say artificial intelligence, you'd be wrong. Because even though it's cool to think about vendors creating AI products that replace humans, one of the things that AI does not do is replace expertise, right? So somebody needs to come up with a strategy. Somebody needs to implement these tools. And one of the ways you can diversify your team is by looking for things that you want to do. So if you're having a hard time hiring security people, why not hire a developer or somebody to prototype things or a data scientist? And then think about what capabilities that would bring to your team. So even if you aren't creating products for other business units, you may have a pile of data that would be valuable to you to have better visibility into. Maybe it would be better from a delivery perspective if you had a different way of presenting data to your internal or external customers. And that's really where adding additional capabilities helps. Diversity and backgrounds. It also gives you a new way of thinking about things because people from other disciplines tend to think differently. And that's one thing that we've had a problem. We can think like attackers very well, but sometimes when we're trying to think like another group, it doesn't always work out. Internships are another thing that are what you make of them. If you see an internship as some sort of burden that needs to be managed, then that's exactly what it'll be. But one of the things that you get from an internship that I think many people don't think about is that an internship uh, can provide you a source of ideas that is untainted by your company. So we kind of get caught up in the company politics and it's hard for us to break out of that sometimes. But an intern, they've never been exposed to your internal politics. So they could be a valuable source of new ideas. And of course, if they're good, then you can help fill the skills gap on that front. But speaking of people on our security teams, one of the things that I think many security groups don't do 
is provide some sort of business education. So if you have a small company and you make one product, maybe that's not very complex. But if you work at a large organization with multiple pillars and multiple in income streams, it becomes a lot harder to understand where all that money comes from and how all the units of the business work together. We like to talk about creating security champions, but we don't always want to be business champions. We think that's everybody else's job. But the more plugged into the business you get, the more of an understanding you get, uh, the better off you are, because it means you can communicate with the people that you're trying to affect change on. You understand where they're coming from, you understand why they may or may not be doing something. And maybe that means that we need to choose a different route. If we know that something is a problem, then we, maybe we need to do something else that solves our goal, but like meets their goals as well. So retain and diversify teams, business education, creating business champions, university partnerships. Pretty much every organization has an office that's in proximity to some university, some opportunity there. Uh, and make, make your accomplishments known. That's one of the, st I had like 80 slides, I'm sorry. So that came from one of the other slides. But if you'd like to talk about that, I'm more than happy to do that afterwards. So with all the slides that I skipped, this is the summary. So a few things I'd like you to take away from what I said today. One of them is just not being difficult or have empathy and understand why people uh, may be pushing back. Um, solutions don't need to be perfect. Uh, we need to look for ways to turn PEBCAC into UBCAC uh, or whatever. Opportunities exist between keyboard and chair. Um, increase communication, do more brainstorming sessions with people outside of our groups. New perspectives. Diversify your security team and add more capabilities, because that's really the way to look at it. It's not that, well, I had a security gap, so I just filled it with somebody else, and now I guess I can do this. No, there's an opportunity there to increase your service, to increase capabilities. Align goals with other business units. Um, because if we are on the wrong page, if we are on different pages, we'll never be successful. Focus on enablement and reducing friction. And more focus on integrity over confidentiality and availability. I think that's coming very soon. So with that, that's my talk. Thank you. Yeah, I don't, uh, this is the last talk of the day, so I'm going to be hanging out for a while. If anybody has any questions, I'll also be doing one of the community breaks tomorrow at two something, I think it's in your schedule, where I'm going to be talking about security agility and adding um, agile components to security programs. And from here, I'm leaving and going to an event here. I'll stay as long as you have questions, but uh, you're more than welcome to follow me to the event. All right, thank you.